All right. I think that we are good. Um, I've waited for the stragglers. So with further ado, I will begin. Um, thank you guys so much for showing up today for the PID overview. We're going to be specifically talking about the Simon PLC in respect to that. So for those that don't know, um, PID can be used in these type of common applications. So if you need to control temperature, for example, your household thermostat, that is an example of a PID control. Um, speed control, you maybe you use it on every day when you go to work. So like when you're driving to work, you turn on cruise control, that would be another example of PID. Pressure control, so maybe you have an operation that is based on tank volume. So that in essence is a PID. It might not be as sophisticated and fast as speed or temperature control, but at the end of the day, it is technically a PID apparatus or application when you're basing your um, your your output on a pressure input. So technically, that would be a PID for us. Um, and then flow control, maybe you're doing some chemical mixing. That would also be an example of um, PID as well. So you know, um, maybe you need to. Maybe the um, the mixture that you're making doesn't have the correct composition of chemicals. And then you can either speed up or slow down the amount of chemicals you're adding. So that would also be another example of PID. So those would be the common applications that you could see PID being used in. So let me see if I, I think I missed one person. Oh, well. All right. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or um, you know stop me. I don't mind going over items in detail. So some common equipment that you could see yourself using in a PID application, as we mentioned before, we talked about temperature. So if a furnace and air conditioning, that is what you would use to complement a PID in a, like a household setting or some other type of temperature setting. A, a motor, um, like in your car, for example, can, or you know the speed of the motor, how fast it runs could be dependent on what you set your cruise control to. So that would be another example of PID. Um, an actuator, sensors, so how do we interpret that tank volume? That would be through a sensor. Um, I spelt these out, but you most commonly know these as RTD and TC. But if you didn't know, RTD stands for resistance thermo uh, temperature detector, and TC stands for thermocouple. So there's three different ways to detect temperature in industrial automation that I know of, and especially what Simon provides. So that would be RTD. TC and thermistor. So this could be the way that you interpret the temperature signal. And then when you provide feedback to your environment to change the temperature by turning on a furnace or air conditioning, that would be PID. Um, of course, we have encoder. So if you don't know what an encoder is, that is for high-speed counting. Um, that could be coupled with a motor. So it's feedback, essentially. So for a PID to work correctly, you do need feedback because you don't know how fast something is going. You don't know how hot something is. Um, you don't know the composition of something or the volume. So at, at the very least, you do need feedback for a true PID example to work. And then last but not least, I'm sure this has been heard of a lot. So a variable frequency drive, a VFD most commonly works um, or is coupled with a PLC and its PID feature to work in harmony. So I've been talking a lot about PID. I've talked about the common applications, the common equipment. What is PID? Now I am going to read through this slide, but I'm going to stop and talk about it. So PID stands for proportional integral and derivative. Now, for those that have taken calculus, you might've heard those terms before, but that does not mean you need to know them. Um, it helps if you know them. Um, it can kind of help you understand the whole formula um, the, the calculation method, all that fun stuff. But for anyone else that has never taken calculus or knows what these terms are, you don't actually have to understand them at all. That is just what the acronym stands for. So you can kind of ignore that pro it means proportional integral and derivative because that's not going to really help you. I'm going to show you the workflow of how to use PID without knowing what those terms mean at all. So this feature is used to achieve a steady state within an apparatus or application through feedback and manipulation. So that was a pretty hefty sentence. What does that mean? So steady state, that means you want to achieve like equilibrium. You want to be at a certain value all the time. 
And then it's through feedback. So that was what I was mentioning in the last slide. You need a certain type of feedback in order for you to know what type of output you need to generate to get to steady state. So these three factors, which are called the SV, the PV, and the, uh, the MV, work in harmony together to generate a PID application. So the three main components of PID that every user should know are the set value, SV, the process value, PV, and the manipulation value, MV. So this manner of process control, or this manner of process control keeps the PV as close as possible to the SV. So we'll, we'll denote that as like steady state, which attributes to consistency, efficiency, and cost savings. This is why people use PID. Maybe you've heard your friend or colleague talk about cruise control in a car and how it saves you gas. It's absolutely true. PID is going to be better at staying at a consistent speed than you will manually. And that's not to insult you, but that's more of like, that's just like, it's a perfected formula from, you know, calculus, whatever. Um, it's a perfected formula that generates efficiency. That is the reason that people use it. That is the reason that your thermostat uses it. Um, I can only imagine trying to derive uh, a PID formula myself. I think I, at the end of like the whole process, you know, given a, maybe a year or whatever, um, you would eventually arrive maybe at the same conclusion, the same formula that we have derived um, for our PID calculation. So let's break apart each of these variables. The SV, which is the set value, that is the desired value for a steady state. So that is the that is the value that you're changing your thermostat to. So you're like, oh, I want the thermostat to be 72 Fahrenheit. That is going to be the set value. Your PV is the feedback from the apparatus, the application. So otherwise known as like maybe the ambient um, environmental factor. So in your house, you want it to be 72 Fahrenheit, but it's currently 65 Fahrenheit. The 65 Fahrenheit that would be the PV, that is the feedback from your apparatus. And then we have the MV, which is um, the output that is calculated based on the difference between the SV and the PV. So you need to know when you have to turn on your furnace or whether you need to turn on your air conditioning. So that would be the MV, that is the manipulation value. So I'm gonna give you an example below. The desired temperature in your house is set on the thermostat, that is your SV. The PV is the ambient temperature in your house. That is what the temperature actually is inside the house. And then the furnace or air conditioning turning on would be the MV. And then you would, you know, you would give it a certain um, magnitude of what temperature it should be generating. More often than not, people or engineers just choose one static temperature to output for the furnace and for the air conditioning seldomly do they use like an analog control i mean you can but um i've seen it time and time again like for ac they'll choose like a generic like 55 degrees fahrenheit for the output for air conditioning and then maybe like i think in like 98 or something like that for the heating um it's just easier to do that but you can most certainly develop some type of analog response when you're using the mv so are there any questions on this slide but before i be um Go to the next slide. And I will take silence as a response. So I'm gonna allow these gentlemen to talk. I haven't, I didn't even see you guys come in. Welcome to the presentation. We haven't gotten that far. We just defined what PID is. And just to let you guys know, this is being recorded. Um, you will get the presentation from me. And if you have further questions, feel free to ask them now or send an email to support at simoninc.com. And we would be more than happy to engage in a more intimate setting where you need um, to understand your PID application or further understand PID. Uh, thank you. For the moment, at least in my case, I have no questions. You can proceed. All right. Thank you so much for letting me know. All right. So let's continue to define what is PID. So maybe some people are just visual learners. That's me. I'm a visual learner. So that last slide probably would not have helped me on my first go around. So let's look at it from the PLC perspective. What is going on? So the CPU module is the PLC. That is the PLCS. So as you can see, there's a couple variables in here. We have a set value. There's that set value again, the SV. 
There's the process value, the process variable. That's the PV. There's the PID operation. That's the magic, right? That's the formula that's um, happening within the CPU. It's doing some calculations based on the set value and the PV. And then it generates an automatic manipulation value. And what is that manipulation value again? That is the response the, the, the PLC is giving to either an analog card or to a digital card or some type of maybe a VFD. Some type of um, operation is going to be generated um, based on the inputs, set value and process value. Because we need to know when we want to turn on that air conditioning. We need to know when we want to turn on that furnace. That is what is going to be your automatic manipulation value. You can do a manual manipulation value. Like I said, I don't recommend this. This is like you turning cruise control off and then you uh, you know you you putting your foot on the the gas right like that's not going or you know on the accelerator that's not going to help you save gas i mean i i don't even use cruise control but in you know in the whole setting of using cruise control you will always be beat by a pid application um it's just going to in the long run it's just going to surpass you um so where does that manipulation value go to? It's going to go to an analog card. So right here, I have DA module. What does that stand for? For us, that means it's a, turning a digital value, like a binary value, into an analog response. So maybe we're turning the value 16,000, our digital output, into an analog response, such as like 10 volts or 5 volts, 20 milliamps, something of that nature. And then we're sending that value, this manipulation value, to the control system. So it gets the response. It's like, hey, wait. You want you want to um, you're generating a 10 volt value to me. What do I need to do? And then it will operate. It will do something based on that response. It, I mean, you could generate a digital response too, like an off and on response. But in this scenario, we're generating an analog response. So maybe we generate like 7.5 volts. Then the VFD or whatever control system you're using will interpret that 7 by um, 7.5 volts um, output and then generate its appropriate response. And then it will send a value, a, like it'll send something to the sensor. Like the your your environment will start to change. Um, the, the apparatus, the temperature in the house will start to change. The sensor in the house will detect that. It'll send it to the analog um, to digital module. So the way that you interpret the analog signal. So maybe it's a an RTD module or a thermocouple module. So you're interpreting that temperature, and then that is your process value. And then we just rinse and repeat in this cyclical mo motion. That's all we have to do. So we have a set value of the 72 Fahrenheit. Um, we're generating or we're reading a value of 65 Fahrenheit. So we know we want to heat up the house. So our automatic mani manipulation value should be like, hey, analog card, please turn on the furnace at this magnitude. And then that will happen. And then eventually you will reach a steady state of 72 Fahrenheit where nothing needs to be on until you know the external or the the actual environmental temperature outside the house kind of heats or cools down the house so at the very essence this is what pid is in terms of a plc talking to a control system so let's look at it graphical wise or from a graph wise so let's have temperature on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis let's well, let's remember these words by the way so reverse is going to be cooling and forward is going to be heating. You're going to see these two terms show up again, forward and reverse. So, um, I mean, as the graph shows, if the SV is down here, the PV is up here. So the higher you go in the y-axis, the hotter it is essentially, right? So if the SV is down here, that means I need to cool it down because the value that I'm interpreting is too hot compared to what I want it to be. And this doesn't have to be a household. This doesn't have to be your thermostat. That's just an example. I have personally used the PID application or the PID feature with like an extruder. So cooling and heating um, this like giant metal wire or um, bar coming out of the machine. So, I mean, that is one way to take advantage of using the PID um, feature for the PLC. So the PV is very hot. It's like, we know that we need to cool it down. So we're gonna turn on the reverse action. We're gonna start cooling the system down. And then you'll start seeing like this uh, synodal wave, right? Where it's like up and down. So we're trying to stay at steady state very closely. Now you can't keep a perfect line. You're never gonna be able to stay on that line perfectly. 
So that's what like it it'll turn on and then it'll turn off. It'll turn off probably right here if you can see my mouse and then it will overshoot a little bit and then the environment will start pushing it back up on its own and then you'll probably turn it on right here and the environment's still pushing on and then it'll come back down, you'll turn off and then so forth and so forth. And you get this little like curved motion along the set value. That's what your steady state is. So the manipulation value, by the way, it's not shown in this graph, but that is what's driving the PV down. And then on the opposite side, we have forward action. So we'll denote that as heating. So that is when the PV is less than the SV. So when it's colder in the house than what you want the temperature of the house to be, we're going to increase the PV towards the SV, generating that sinodal curve that we saw, we saw in the last graph. So the same process just on the opposite side of the SV. This is inherently what is going on behind the scenes in your thermostat. Okay, for those of you that want to know what is the formula, what, how do we calculate our PAD, this is the formula. I don't care about this formula. I never studied it, but I know that you know engineers, they like to be very thorough and complete. So here you go. I'm providing it all to you. I'm not going to go through every single constant because a lot of it's just constants. Um, I would say that these are constants, the top like eight. Um, your MV, SV, and PV are not constants. The SV is technically a constant. That is something that you set, right? That's you, you choose what you want the set value to be. And then the process value, as we just explained, that is the, the feedback from your apparatus. And then the MV is the response. And like, it's the response to the difference between the SV and the PV. But here are the formulas that we use to calculate the MV. Okay, so inside Psycon software, I'm going to open it up real quick. I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to choose the PLCS. That's my favorite PLC. So I'm just going to choose that one. I'm going to press OK. I'm going to right click on program and choose new program. And you'll notice that we have a PID program right here. You can just choose that, press OK. And you'll get this GUI object, this little dialog box to show up. So that is how I got to this screen. I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. So there are a couple items I wanna talk about here. I don't wanna talk about the whole thing because a lot of it is a distraction in my opinion. Um, I'm removing a lot of the noise for you and I want you to like hone in and focus on these individual items. Um, just focusing on these items should take you a long way when you're using the PID application. So let's remember, Forward means heating and reverse means cooling. Um, forward also could mean speeding up and reverse could also mean slowing down in terms of speed when we're doing like motor control or something like that nature. So forward is zero and reverse is one. So what that means is if you want to change the direction, the path calculation within your PID program, you can change the data register of this one being D2. You can change the data register from zero to one or from one to zero. If you're in a forward path calculation, meaning heating, and your PV is above the SV, and you're expecting to generate some type of response to bring that PV down, it's not gonna work. You're in a heating path calculation. You need to change it to a reverse path calculation, so a cooling method. So again, I'm gonna repeat that. The forward path calculation is heating. So if your PV, your temperature that you're reading is higher than your SV, so it's 92 Fahrenheit and you're trying to get down to 80 Fahrenheit, it, your path calculation forward is not going to work because the heater is not going to turn on and that's not going to try to accommodate a higher temperature than your SV. What you need to do is you need to change it to reverse cooling and then it will start turning on your air conditioning and then bringing that temperature down towards your SV. And that is sometimes you have that thermostat setting the auto, right? It's not heating or cooling, it's both. So you'll you'll like when you go above the SV, it'll start heating or cooling. And when you go below the SV, it starts um, heating. So it can use both simultaneously. I don't recommend doing that, um, but that is what you need to know about forward and reverse, zero and one. Until you get really sophisticated, get your, you know, get your bearings with this feature, I would recommend just staying in one path calculation. Um, it'll help you out in the long run. And then you can kind of like deviate and start using both of them uh, together in the same. 
So what I mean by that, the next following point is loops. So there are 32 loops. And what does 32 loops mean? It's the number of steady states that could be controlled. So in layman's terms, I could essentially control 32 different thermostats. I can control 32 different rooms in the same environment, all 32 of those temperatures, um, or 32 motors, or a mix and match. It doesn't have to be motors and temperature. It could be anything. I can control 32 different models is essentially what I'm saying here. And on that note, you can scan all of them simultaneously, or you can do one scan at a time. Maybe the second loop is dependent on the first loop. And what I mean by that is maybe you have a 32 step application where the next step is dependent on this, um, the first step. And then the third step is dependent on the second step and the fourth one and so forth and so forth. So um, the temperature change or the speed change is for the second step is dependent on the first one. So maybe you do one loop per scan, or maybe you're just controlling 32 loops um, independently of one another. It's just 32 different unique rooms. So you can scan all of them simultaneously. It is dependent on your application. So you can, it's a dynamic value. You can do one loop per scan. You can do two loops per scan, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what is meant by a loop. It's, the, it's a steady state that you're trying to control. It's a PID model. Um, PID um, int. So what does this stand for? PID initialization. So you'll see that that is over here. So it is the start of the data control. You'll see that D0. Um, that is our data register, by the way, in the PLC. So in layman's terms, that is just an integer. That is just a, an integer data type. So, and then the rest of it's going to be offset. So you'll notice that D0 is the starting point. D2 is the path calculation, D3 is sampling time, so forth, so forth, so forth. And then PID calculation, that is start that starts at D100 by default. Now, if you have more than one scan, this can get tricky. So if you have 32 loops, you're going to want to accommodate the range here. So between zero and 100 is not gonna work. And I'll show you what I'm talking about right here. So if I choose 32 loops down here, this is not going to work because it's going to give me an error. It's going to want, hey, your PID calculation um, starting address needs to be greater than PID integer plus the number of loops times 20 plus 32. So we'll take 32 times 20, add to, and then add that to whatever the starting address here is. And then PID calculation needs to be greater than that. So by one, I'm not going to do the math real quick. Um, but just to let you know, you will get an error message if you do not have the correct amount of distance between your starting point um, and your ending point, your PID, PID calculation. So if I swap this back to one, everything will be fine. Um, it let me save correctly. So I'm gonna hop back into the presentation. So to, re to recap, what is PID, in, um, uh, PID int? That is PID initialization. That, you as that is what's going to be used to assign the constants from the PID program to the PID formula. So again, those PID constants consist of the sampling time, the KP, the KI, the KD, the filter. All of these are constants except like the SV, the PV, and the MV, right? So PID int is basically all of the constants being accounted for in the PID formula. It'll load it up into the formula and it shouldn't be changed throughout the whole application. Um, that is not to say that you can't do it, but maybe that shouldn't be the first time you do it. Um, when you gain more, you gain your bearings, right? You gain more experience, exposure to PID, then you can start change the, changing the constants at will. But PID calculation is the counterpart to PID, and, and that is it's doing the calculation, right? It's generating an MV, so a manipulation value, an output based on the steady state that you want, the set value, and based on the ambient temperature or the ambient environment, the process value, and the PID int values. So those are the constants that we talked about, the KP, the KI, KD, all of those. Now, one thing that Simon loves that we offer is auto-tuning. So this is why I was trying to say you don't need to know that formula. You don't need to, honestly, all you really need to know for PID calculation on Simon's M is what does PID and stand for? What does PID calculation stand for? What is a loop? What is forward reverse? And then, um, kind of understanding the difference between the three variables, SV, PV, and MV. And you just let your apparatus auto-tune itself. So what does that mean? 
it we will do the heavy lifting for you. We will handle the burden of calculation for you. So we will generate the best permutation of constant values for your application. So what I'm saying is if you set up your application the way you need it to be set up, not in your home office, not in some other environment where it's not going to be deployed. When you're setting up a PID, it should be in the apparatus it's going to be deployed in. So many environmental factors will affect your PID application by like a, a minuscule amount. And it's enough to not generate your expected outcome. So I always tell people this, take into account uh, humidity, take into account elevation, your home office. Like these are not um, environments that you want to be doing your PID operation in. Um, because when you deploy it, it's going to be in a, in a, in different environments. So you don't want it to be in a different environment when you're doing a PID calculation. So uh, I'm going to beat this to a dead pulp essentially. So auto tuning, we have a little button over here, top middle, you'll see that it's grayed out. How does that show up? Well, you have to be connected to the PLC. I took this image when I wasn't connected to the PLC, I guess. So we have a little button right here for auto tuning. You would click on that, but before you do that, you can click on mon view. So that's going to be monitor view. And I will show you an explicit example with simulator so you can kind of understand this um, from my, what I'm trying to explain right now. But essentially, you just press the button start, you initiate your PLC, turn it on, and it will do the rest. It will start um, generating your output for you. It'll start interpreting the PV for you um, based on your set value, of course, the one that you choose. You have to do one thing. You have to press auto tune and then choose your set value and then we will handle the rest. And then from there on out, it will um, create a different permutation of constants here. Like you won't see the value 8,000 or 200 or a zero anymore. It'll generate the best values for you and it will change those. And you'll see that when I show it to you in the example. So the last point I wanna cover here is called LD convert. So that means ladder diagram convert. So Basically, you're just tran transforming this GUI object, this dialog box, into a ladder diagram. So most people are, are comfortable with this GUI object, this dialog box, um, or you could be more comfortable with the ladder diagram. It's just up to you. Just note, when you press ladder diagram convert, there's no going back to the GUI object. You will have to delete the program and then recreate it from scratch if you do go to ladder diagram convert and you don't like it. Now, some advantages of ladder diagram convert. You get better control of the data registers. You can control the PID calculation from starting and stopping on its own. Um, you get way more control over the functionality from the ladder. Um, I would say this dialog box is more so for people that just don't want to do anything. They don't want to control. They just want to auto tune it and then deploy it to the customer. That's perfectly fine. You can do either one. There's advantages and um, disadvantages to both methods. All right, so I'm gonna go through an example again. Um, this is an example configuration. So as you see right here, these are the three variables that I want you to focus on, SV, PV, and MV. Now, if we recall, this was on the last slide right here. So SV, PV, and MV, those three right here. When you double click on this blank field right here, you'll get something to show up where it allows you to choose the module, the base, and the memory address. So the module base being zero to 16, it's always gonna be zero for PLCS because we can't do base expansion. Um, the module, it can be a one or a two in our example because we have an analog card and we have a temperature card. Um, and I'll go through that um, when I get back to the slide. And then the memory address, this is the buffer memory of the analog or temperature card. Um, so you can actually interpret it or send the value to it. So um, basically, you could set this to zero, set this to one, set this to two, and then it will take care of it for you. It will generate, it will, it will let you know that you're sending the value, whatever's in D102 is going to be sent to the buffer memory two um, to send out that, that analog signal. And likewise, maybe I want to do this. For this one, we're going to send the value from buffer memory one to D01. And then D01 is going to be part of the PID application. It'll do its calculation. And then we'll send D102 to the buffer memory address number two. So 
this is just how Simon handles talking to analog cards for those that don't know how Simon um, PLCs work. We use instructions called from and to to send and receive data with buffer memories of our um, our modules, like our analog modules, not our digital cards, but like our analog cards, like temperature, current, voltage, those type. So from and to. So I'm going to go back into the slide. Now let's look at this PLC example. We have a we have a PLCS CPU. We have an analog card, so digital. Um, this is an analog output card, so digital to analog. And then we have an RTD card, which is our temperature input. And we're going to be controlling, or we're going to be interpreting the temperature through channel two of the RTD card. So we need to take that into account when we're looking at this instruction up here. And we're going to be sending out our analog response to the heater through channel two of the analog card. So um, the PLCS is talking to both of these modules like this. There is an RTD sensor within the room that is detecting the ambient temperature. It's sending it to channel two of the RTD card. The PLCS does some calculations and then sends its response to the analog card generating through channel two and telling the heater how long to turn on, how hot to be, et cetera. So the three values in harmony I want you to pay attention to is the set value. That's the value you want the temperature to be at. The process value, so we're going to use the instruction from. So we're taking the buffer memory number 12. So that's going to be channel to Fahrenheit um, from, the R, uh, from the RTD card. And we're going to send that to D101, which is an integer data register. And we're going to, it's going to be a total of one. So just one word. We don't need to worry about that. And this H0002, that is just the slot number that the RTD card exists at. So 012. You don't really need to know what H0002 stands for because we kind of handle it for you, right? So if I go back to this process value, that H002 is essentially just the slot number. So we know the RTD card was at number two and we wanted buffer memory address number 12. And I press okay. And then that handled it for me. It was that easy. Now you might be wondering, well, how do I know that it's buffer memory number 12? So if you go to the help file and then you go to contents, and then you go to CM3, right? We can go to our RTD card right here. I can go to the buffer memory address or buffer memory table. I'm looking for channel two, temperature value in Fahrenheit. Maybe you're looking for Celsius or maybe you're looking for the digital. It, it just so happens you can choose any of them. But I, I decided to choose Fahrenheit. So I'm going with buffer memory address number 12 for channel two in Fahrenheit. So that's where I got the number 12 from. It's from the help file. And then the number two, again, that is the slot number. So the CPU is zero. The analog card was number one, RTD card number two. So I need to change this, or it is already changed actually. So the analog card is number one here. So I'm gonna go to the analog card, right? So we're using analog, let's say that we're doing voltage. So I believe that, where am I blind right now? I am right here. So we're gonna go to the buffer memory or shared memory table. And I want channel two output. So that'll be buffer memory address number two. Just so happens that I chose the correct one. So now this analog output card is set. It's good to go for me. So again, the PLCS is doing all of the heavy burden. It's doing all of the auto tuning, the calculations, et cetera, et cetera. The MV, uh, Jacinto, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh... Um, I guess that the 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 numbers about about where the machine where the pieces are from are depending of the system. Let's say the R RTD is a third one or a fourth one, and I have to pull the number four or number three. I'm not sure if I'm making myself understood. understood. Are you are you talking about the channel, like channel three and channel four, or your yeah, I'm, the, No, I'm talking about the the yes, the channel, not the memory section, the 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 numbers so, on the channel. Okay, so let's go back to the RTD card, and then we'll go to buffer memory. So say that you need channel three, then you would just grab thirteen. If no, you no, need, I, I meant, I meant, go to the principal, go to the primary window. The primary window, this one. 
Yeah, I meant the when you choose one of them, there is an option to choose to put a number. I'm trying to click on it one second. Okay, yeah. And the model slot, I meant that. I I guess it means that it's dependent of the of the it's of the location. People. It's it's the location of the module in the um in the expansion. So PLCS is slot number zero. The analog card is slot number one. And then the RTD module is slot number two. So that is where that number came from. No, but, but uh, what I want to ask is that, let's say I made something else and the model is not in two, but it's in the number three or number one. Okay. Can, then uh, yeah, you, you would change it to three or four. But it's dependent on how you build the, the system, right? Of course, I'm, yes. Okay. So, and, and remember, you can have more than one loop. So one loop is only ever going to use one analog input, like, or one temperature input, right? So you will know which card you're grabbing from. This, this should not ever be dynamic, right? Unless you're deploying it to a different customer and they change the location, I would recommend that they match your uh, schematic. But if it happens that you need to change it, um, you can definitely deploy it. You just need to know what their um, PLC layout is going to be. You have to know what the layout of the modules are going to be. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, slot number two, like if I go to, if I, or if I go to loop number two, I can definitely choose another slot. Maybe this might help as well. Um, you know, you can account for different permutations. Uh, you can account for different um, customers essentially. So, and you don't have to turn on loop one and two, like loop two can be off always if you want it to be. Um, notice how I, I only choose one loop right here or actually I didn't know it. Hold on one second. All right. So I have two loops right here. If I go to loop two, I can change this one to three and this one to 12. Oops, one second, sorry. Well, all right. So now this is slot number three. That RTD card is now in slot three instead of two. So it just depends. And then like, I think, I'm not mistaken, one second. What happens if I reselect it? it yeah, and it doesn't erase. So depending on your customer, you can accommodate their PLC layout. Um, but, you know, before you deploy your project, I would I would definitely want to know what does their PLC expansion base look like? And then just accommodate their layout. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. And if I didn't answer your question, stick around for more um, or stick around after the meeting. We can go into more detail. Uh, anyway, so that is pretty much the example. How much time do we have? Okay, so we're, we're, we're doing pretty good on time. So are there any questions on this slide? Does everyone understand why or how this is working. And I'll take silence as an answer. Don't worry. You don't have to actually say like I understand. So if you guys understand, that's great. Um, stop me if you don't. But this is pretty much the very essence of PID. Now, we talked about auto tuning PV and SV. I'm going to throw a curveball at you. So Simon, I've never heard of this before, but Simon has something called relay tuning. So relay tuning is for those engineers that are not using an analog response. And what do I mean by that? I, I prefaced this in the beginning of the, um, the presentation when I was saying when you're doing like a temperature control, sometimes they don't do an analog response, meaning like when I want to cool something down, I always generate 55 degrees Fahrenheit signal. When I want to heat something up, I'm always generating a 100 degree Fahrenheit si um, signal. Like there is no in between. It's either off or it's on. So that is what we would call as a relay. It's either off or on relay tuning. So let's talk about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So I'm trying to cool something on or cool something off. And it's just like, it knows to turn it on for a little bit, turn it off, turn it on for a little bit, turn it off and so forth and so forth. So this is actually a digital signal, but we're just creating a frequency, right? So the PID will calculate how long does that digital signal need to be on to generate the appropriate environment? 
or the generate the appropriate response rather too, right? So where is that setting found? That setting is found in D105. It doesn't always have to be D105, but if you look at auto manual, this operand right here, you double click on that field right here, you'll see that the tuning options show up. By default, it will be zero because you know typically we think that you're gonna wanna use an analog response in your auto tuning process, but you change the value to one, press okay, you will now be in a relay tuning uh, method. So just to reiterate, that is found right here. Double click, changes to one, press OK, and boom, you're done. You're now in a relay tuning path calculation. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it. I just wanted to show you that this option is open for those that are using a on and off type approach with um, like a, a static temperature output or something of that nature. Now I'm going to demonstrate PID with the PLC simulator. It's not going to look pretty, but I'm going to show you what you should kind of expect when you're doing this at your own environment. Like what, is, what are the type of messages you should see? What, um, what does the graph look like and stuff like that? Because after this, um, we are pretty much done with this presentation. So I need to reset some stuff. So I'm going to exit out of this. I'm going to delete that. And then I'm going to create the PID program again. All right. So I'm going to leave everything as is by default, except I'm going to change. Oh, this is something I forgot to mention. So if you need your KD, if you need it, you need to change it to at least a non-zero value. Because if it is zero, you're telling the system that you don't want that on. So by changing it to 0.01, now it will be utilized in the formula and we will change this value in the constant. So you'll see that this 8,200 and 0.01 are going to change when I auto tune this um, PID. So I'm gonna go online, connect option, simulator, press okay. I'm going to link download and monitor. And then we're going to monitor the PID, like the PV, the MV and the SV. And then we're going to see what we um, see the response we get on the graph. We're going to use monitor view and auto tuning together. Okay, so I'm going to click on monitor view. We get this little window to show up, and then I want to press start auto tuning. So before I do that, I want to open up my memory monitor because I need to be able to change the value on demand. So I'm going to change this to the D registers, and then we're looking. We're in. Um, we're concerned with D100, D101, and D102. So D100 is the set value. That's the steady state value we want to achieve. PV is the environment. That's the ambient value. That's the the feedback we're getting from our application. And then MV is our response to the PV difference between the SV. So or the difference between the SV and the PV. So the one I'm going to actually be changing is the PV. I'm going to be the proxy for the feedback because we don't, I mean, this is a simulation. So I will pretend to be the feedback of the apparatus so we can kind of see what's going on. So I'm going to start auto tuning. I'm going to choose the value like 1000. It's going to be a value between zero and 16,000, right? So I'm just choosing the value 1000. And we're going to step up casually to 1000 with our PV. So straight out the gate, we should see the MV just ramp up to 16,000 immediately. So I'm going to start the auto tuning process. We see that the MV is already 16,000. So it's expecting like a change. So I'm going to change the value in increments of 50 like this. And then eventually we will see that the 16,000 will start to drop when I get closer to 1,000. And it won't change yet because I'm doing increments of 50, but we're gonna get there. So this is the message you should expect to see when it's been auto-tuned correctly. And then you press yes. And then now my, my, um, my loop has been auto-tuned correctly. So now I'm gonna keep going up to 1000 to kind of show you what the MV does. So notice that the MV dropped down a little bit there. It was a, it was a little bit, but it did. 
And then it, it dropped down a little bit more. It dropped down to zero, 850. So it's dropping down, right? So you see a different number than 16,000. What number did I choose? 850, 900. And then we're gonna do 925, 950, 975, and then a good 1,000. And then we'll go up to 1025, and then back down to 1,000, 975, 1,000, and then we'll leave it at 1,000. So you can see that this response right here, this MV, that is the value that you're going to be sending at your application to keep the PV at the same value as the SV. That is what you're doing. So you'll see that this yellow nonsense over here, this line on the graph, that is your MV. That's what you're sending to the analog card. That's how long you're turning on that digital signal to um, change the environmental value. To either speed up the motor, slow down the motor, um, turn on the furnace, turn on the air conditioning, what have it. So that's pretty much what PID is, essentially. So I can stop this. I'm going to exit. So we're going to um, go back to the PID program. I'm gonna disconnect. And what do we notice right away? These three values changed. So the KP, the KI, and the KD, they, those all changed on their own. I did not change these, right? So auto-tuning changed this from 8,000, I think it was, to 30,000. This was changed from 2.0. I don't. I, I forgot the number that it was. But now it's 7.8. And then the last one, we I know we ha had it set to 0 0.01. And now that is 1.17. And then the filter got changed as well. So these constant values were changed based on the auto-tuning process. So we take care of the heavy lifting for you is what I was trying to get at. Um, and then this was also in terms of heating, by the way. So last but not least, I want to show you what the ladder diagram counterpart looks like. So I'm going to change the MV right here to, this was slot one and then two. And then this one was slot two and then 12. I'm gonna change this to the ladder diagram. Notice that you get a little window here that says you cannot go back. Do you wanna convert anyway? You press okay. So this is what the PID program looks like from a ladder standpoint. Um, a lot of these numbers should look familiar like the 30,000, the 78, the one, um, 117. So that is the 1.17, the 7.8, the 30,000. So you'll notice here at the bottom that the PID initialization starts at D0 like we said and then it's on at first scan only. So we'll load in all of those constants into the PID calculator. And then this one, F13 is always on essentially. It's just off at the first scan only. So it's always on after the first scan. So we're grabbing that digital, that, that temperature value from the analog card. And then this one's off at first scan only. So we're always doing a PID calculation and we're always sending our MV to that analog output card. So now the beauty of this is that I can actually turn the PID calculation off whenever I want without having to turn the PLC into stop mode. What I can do is I can create like an emergency stop button, something of this nature, right? So when I turn my emergency button on, this will not be true anymore, right? These X zero zeros because they're, they're closed contacts. So when I turn it to like, an open state, it will be untrue, meaning um, that these won't operate anymore, right? I won't be interpreting that temperature. I won't be sending a value to the analog card. I won't be doing a PID ca calculation. So the ladder diagram um, conversion, what it gives you is it gives you more control over when you're actually doing a PID calculation and whatnot. So you don't have to always be doing that. And you don't have to turn the PLC into stop mode. Also, you can change these values. You can turn them into D registers if you want. So like, maybe you want to change this to D100 or that doesn't make sense actually. D1000. So D1000, maybe you want this one to be um, D1001. Maybe I can do that. Yeah. So, and so forth and so forth. So maybe you want to dynamically control the, the constant values within the program. So then you would have to refire this um, offer or this condition. So this contact, you'd have to change it to something else. So you would refire this, re-energize it. 
and then it would allocate these constants back into the PID formula, and then you could start calculating again. So that's up to you. So that would be the advantage of turning your GUI object, the, the dialog box PID program, into the ladder diagram counterpart. And with that, that is the whole presentation. I do appreciate you guys for sticking around and listening to me. Um, it is quite the pleasure. So when I send out the recording and I send out the presentation, please give me some feedback. I would love to hear what your thoughts and um, concerns are about this. Um, look forward to more webinars coming from Simon. Um, we, we like to host them monthly, at least four of them. I think the next ones, we have two of them next week. One's going to be on IPC and SCADA and on protocols. So like Ethernet IP, Modbus, OPC UA, all of those. So um, you're more than welcome to leave. I'm not going to hold it against you if you don't stay. For those that have further questions, stick around, ask me. I'm I'm here until um, eight more minutes. We have eight more minutes together. So I'll 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 shut up. I'll stop talking and then uh, go ahead and ask questions. Um well, thanks for the presentation. I'll wait for the, I'll wait for the, what's it called? For the email with the, with the recordings. And thanks again for, for explaining this. Absolutely, no problem. It was my pleasure. Uh, take care, everyone. Goodbye. So as I said before, if you want to have a more intimate session, you don't want to ask the questions here in this setting, um, that's not a big deal at all. You can email us at support at simoninc.com or give us a call at 702-820-1060. Option number three will send you to the technical support department. And then, like I said, I'll be around for the next seven minutes to answer any questions you might have.